All right, well, let me go ahead and get going then. Uh, so here's the theorem I introduced last time. So we've been talking about relative property T. Uh, so we have an example of relative property T. We still don't have an example of property T. Uh, so I'll, I'll, by the end of today's lecture, hopefully, uh, well, maybe not today, I don't know. Uh, but uh, I wanna prove some equivalences first about uh, property T. Uh, okay, so these are the equivalences I want to start out with. So uh, the following five conditions on a group are equivalent, or a subgroup and a group are equivalent. Uh, so the first is that the pair has relative property T. Um, uh, and that was just defined, remember, as if you had a representation which had almost invariant vectors, then it had a non-zero sigma invariant vector. The second condition has the same hypotheses that you have a representation with almost invariant vectors, but it has a stronger conclusion in that not only do there exist uh, invariant vectors for sigma, but the invariant vectors can be as close as you want to your almost invariant vectors. Uh, so that's what I've written here. So the projection, so H superscript sigma, this is just my notation for the space of sigma invariant vectors. And this is just the orthogonal projection onto that closed subspace. Uh, and this is it. Uh, I should remark that one, the equivalence of one and two is easy if, if your subgroup is a normal subgroup, uh, because then the space of sigma invariant vectors becomes a, uh, a sub representation. So, um, so if you had almost invariant vectors, then you could project to the complement where you, where you then get a contradiction. But, uh, but we'll prove that one and two are equivalent even if sigma is not a normal subgroup. So this, uh, I believe, was first done by Jolesan in the non-normal subgroup case. Uh, the third condition is that whenever we have a sequence of positive, uh, positive type functions on the group, which converge to one pointwise, then they converge to one uniformly on the subgroup. Uh, the fourth condition, every conditionally negative, negative type function is bounded on sigma. And the fifth condition, every co-cycle is bounded on sigma. Okay. And so I'll start off with some of the easier ones that we've already done. And that is that uh, four is equivalent to five. So that we've already done because we saw that uh, for any conditionally negative type function C, uh, we can associate a co-cycle, uh, uh, C a co-cycle, into some representation. And for every co-cycle, we can associate a conditionally negative type function. And the relationship between these was that C of T was exactly the uh, norm of the co-cycle squared. And so you see, of course, one is bounded if and only if the other is bounded. Um, so that's the equivalence of four and five. So that's pretty, pretty easy. Uh, let's see what else. Um, that's the easy one. Uh, three and two, the equivalence of these are also uh, pretty easy. So let's go ahead and show that two and three are equivalent. Um, and so how do we do this? Well, this is again because we have this correspondence between positive type functions and the GNS construction gives us representations with uh, vectors. So we see that if we have uh, phi n positive type functions, so then we have the GNS construction and we get representations pi n from gamma to unitary group on some Hilbert spaces hn, and we get these vectors cn and hn such that bn of t is just the matrix coefficient corresponding to this uh, thing. So that's it's the GNS construction. Uh, and then what do we see? Well, we see that uh, what is, well, first of all, what is the norm of Cn? And this uh, norm squared is just nothing but Vn of 
the identity, which we know converges to one. So if these are not univectors, well, at least asymptotically, they are univectors. Uh, the other thing we know is that if we look at um, uh, Cn minus pi n t Cn norm squared, well, this is nothing but you expand out the inner product and you get that this is twice the norm of Cn squared minus the real part of this inner product, uh, pi, n, pi n t Cn Cn, which is exactly twice, and now we have here phi of the identity, phi n of the identity minus phi n of t, I guess the real part of phi n of t. Um, Uh, and so what do we see about this? We see that this goes to zero as n goes to infinity for all t in gamma. Uh, so we see that uh, if these are positive type functions such that they converge to one pointwise. Uh, so then we get these representations and then we get that these CNs are almost invariant vectors. Uh, okay, so they live in different representations, but of course you could just take a direct sum and, uh, and put them all, we think of all of these HNs, we think of all of them as sitting inside this direct sum of HNs. So, so therefore they all live in this big direct sum of representations. Uh, okay, so this means that if we start with a net uh, of positive functions converging to one point wise, then we produce this uh, net of almost invariant vectors. Moreover, what does it mean? So condition two, if we have here, what is, um, uh, we have, so this shows that the, uh, right, so, um, yeah, if there exists some eta, so if there exists eta n, say the projection onto sigma of xn such that, eta n minus cn goes to zero. So if condition two holds, then we're guaranteed of the existence of this. Then what do we see? Then we see that uh, one minus phi uh, t, phi n t, well, let me put phi n of e, let me see the phi n of e minus phi n of t. Well, this is nothing but, uh, Cn minus pi n t Cn inner product Cn. And now what we can do is we can just uh, use triangle inequality approximate Cn by eta n. And we see that this is less than or equal to, we'll use Cauchy Schwartz, so we'll get a Cn. And then we're going to get uh, Cn minus eta n. And I guess we'll get two of them because we'll replace this Cn and this Cn. And then we're gonna get plus eta n minus pi n t eta n of Cn. So that's cauchy schwartz and triangle inequality. Uh, but what do we see here? We see that this is zero uh, for t in sigma. And so, uh, and we see that this goes to zero uniformly. So what have we shown? I guess we've shown one direction. We showed that uh, three um, or two implies three. Right? That's what we showed. So if two holds, then three holds right here. But conversely, you can also show that three implies two uh, fairly easily as well. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, so, three implies two. Uh, so what this says is that, so I'll remind you here. So this says, uh, if we know that any um, pointwise convergence gives us uniform convergence, then I claim that we have this projection onto the fixed point place, this, this approximation here. So let's go ahead and, uh, and prove that. So suppose, that we have 
um, uh, pi a representation with cn uh, almost invariant. Variant. All right, and then we again consider now just going the other way. We set uh, phi n of t to be the matrix coefficients here, which are positive type. And so then what, what we can do, well, and also notice that they converge to one because of course, here we have one minus phi n of t is nothing but, uh, so almost invariant, I define them to be univectors. So this is just uh, C, well, it's the inner product, C n minus pi n t C n. Oh, this is just pi, we're fixing a rep single representation, uh, C n, C n which is Cauchy-Schwartz is less than Cn minus pi T Cn. And, and this set up by their univectors. And so we have this and this goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So if we start with a, an almost invariant net of vectors, then we get these positive definite functions which converge to one point wise. Uh, but then by condition three, so therefore we have that um, the soup of uh, t n sigma of one minus v n of t uh, goes to zero as n goes to infinity. And I'll actually just need that the soup is less than one half at some point on. So uh, fix n such that the soup of t n sigma of one minus v n of t is say less than one half. I think that's all I'll need. Uh, and then, uh, and what can we say here? Well, we consider the convex whole of the set of all um, pi t c n such that t is in sigma. And then I'll take the closure of this convex hole and let me call it, give this a name, let's call it K. So well, what do we know about K? We know that this is a closed convex subset of the Hilbert space. And then you use this uh, well-known kind of geometric property of Hilbert spaces that if you have any closed convex set, then it has a unique element of minimal norm. So we let, Eta, the, the unique element of minimal norm in K. Uh, so if you're unfamiliar with this uh, result, so yeah, every Hilbert space, in every Hilbert space, whenever you have a closed convex set, uh, it has a unique element of minimal norm. And this is a fun exercise to prove uh, if, you, if, you, if you haven't seen this before. It's, you know, maybe don't try to look it up, but just try to think of how, would, how you would prove it on your own. Um, okay, so here we have this, but on the other hand, we know that the group acts on K um, by the representation and this is norm preserving. It's a unitary representation, so it preserves the norm. So we have that uh, pi t of eta is the unique element of minimal norm in pi t eta of uh, pi t k because it's norm preserving transformation, unitary. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, if t is in sigma, then pi t times k is equal to k because it's a group. So it's change of variables here. So this is equal to k uh, for t and sigma. 
So therefore, we get that uh, pi t of eta is equal to eta for t and sigma. So eta is indeed uh, an invariant vector, uh, but the only thing that's maybe not so clear at this point is why is this non-zero or why is this close to c? But this is close to c because uh, each of these vectors is, um, uh, hold on, so we get this. Uh, so why is this close to c? This is because if uh, we have this uniformity property here. Right? So note that uh, for t and sigma, we have uh, c, cn minus pi t cn, inner product cn, and absolute value, this is equal to absolute value one minus v n t, which is less than, oh, I guess I wanted to just, okay, hold on. Uh, I don't wanna fix this for n because I wanted the whole sequence. So let's not fix n, this is for each n. Uh, one uh, set, I'll just give it a new notation just to make life easier. So this is, this is soup. This soup is equal to epsilon over n. So we know that epsilon over n, epsilon sub n goes to zero, uh, but that's not so important. I just want to not carry this cumbersome notation. Uh, so what do we know about this? This is equal to this, which is less than or equal to epsilon sub n. So, and then notice that this formula right here is uh, stable under taking convex combinations of this pi t of xn. So we get the therefore, uh, so taking convex combinations, we have that the absolute value of xn minus eta uh, Cn is less than or equal to, uh, again, epsilon n. Epsilon sub n. Right, and that's just because, yeah, because of this formula and the fact that you can apply convex combinations, you get it for all things in K, and then you get this equation for all things in the closure of K then. Uh, so here, that's exactly uh, what we wanted to prove. So we get that therefore, I guess, what do we want to prove? We want to prove that CN minus eta N squared. This is what the estimate we want to do. Uh, so this is, uh, I think this should be fine. Uh, maybe I wanted this with the norm instead of the inner product uh, to get the norm estimate I want. Um, yeah, because probably there's going to be some convexity issues here. So I'm going to change this argument slightly. So I'm going to change this to this norm uh, is less than or equal to, well, this is equal to twice. And then here we have one minus the real part of P N T uh, square root, I guess. Uh, and this is epsilon N square root is what I get. Square root. And so now I can put the norm here. Sorry about that, because I want to put the norm instead of the inner product here. We have that the norm of Cn minus eta is less than or equal to epsilon n one half, which indeed goes to zero. Um, okay, sorry about the change there at the end. 
but I want to make sure because of course condition two had the, the norm distance between these going to zero. And so the easiest way to do that is just to notice here we get the norm. And again, if you have this norm less than or equal to some fixed number, then again, taking convex combinations and taking the closure, you again have this. Right? So we'll get a square root there instead of a, instead of epsilon over n, but that's okay. All right, so that then shows the equivalence of conditions two and uh, three. And now, so we've shown these are equivalent. Check there, we've shown these are equivalent. Check there. So now we just have three blocks here that we'll have to show are equivalent. And let's see. So the next one I want to do is uh, if every cocycle if every cocycle is bounded. Uh, so then yeah. So next I want to show five implies three or five implies two. Yeah. So next I'm going to show five implies two. That is if if every cocycle is bounded, uh, so then um, then whenever you have a representation with almost invariant vectors, then you get uh, invariant vectors which are very very close. And so we're going to do this by contraposition. So we'll suppose, suppose pi is a representation and we have Cn uh, in H almost invariant. And we have that the projection onto the fixed point points of Cn minus Cn, uh, we'll just assume, so it's not going to zero, so by choosing some subsequence or subnet, we'll just assume that this is greater than or equal to some fixed number which is greater than zero. Okay, uh, and from this we will construct an unbounded cocycle. So how are we going to do that? Well, um, uh, let's see, do I want my group to be countable for this? Uh, yeah, let me do this when, when gamma is countable. Uh, let me think about that for a moment to what to do when it's uncountable. Well, okay, so I hadn't really thought about that. So maybe let me just add, I don't want to do this on the fly. So let me just say is a countable group here. So I'll give you the rigorous proof when it's a countable group, when it's uncountable, uh, there should be an easy fix to everything I'm going to say, but I haven't thought of it uh, at the moment. Okay, so uh, all right. So by contraposition, suppose there's some representation. We have almost invariant vectors, and from this we construct this uh, subsequence, which satisfies that the projection onto the invariant vectors is uniformly far away from from this sequence of uh, almost invariant vectors. All right. So what can we do from this? Well, again, by taking a subsequence, we'll enumerate the group. That's why I want the group to be countable. So enumerate gamma as uh, say T K, and then uh, for each, we're going to choose a subsequence uh, for each uh, n. Assume that the distance between Cn and pi t uh, k Cn norm squared is say less than one over two to the n, and this is for uh, one less than or equal one less than or equal to k less than or equal to n. 
So I'll choose a subsequence and assume that these vectors are uh, almost invariant and that uh, each T sub K moves it no more than one over two to the N away. And this is for all K between one to N. Uh, so what does this allow us to do? This allows us to then define a co-cycle from gamma to, it's gonna be a direct sum over the whole natural numbers uh, of H. So this will just be the representation direct sum of pi with respect to natural numbers. Uh, and we're gonna define this co-cycle by uh, C of T is just going to be the direct sum of all these uh, CNs minus I of T CNs. All right, so that's the definition of the co-cycle. And then notice that we can compute the norm of the co-cycle. Um, uh, let's see, how do we compute the norm? So it's certainly, yeah, so it's certainly a bounded cos. So, I mean, it certainly is well-defined because of this condition right here. So note, note that C of Tn is going to be less than or equal to, we took a direct sum here. So you're gonna have first the terms uh, below n, which there's nothing we can do about. So it's gonna be the sum as k goes from one to n minus one of cn minus pi ck. Okay. And then for n greater than, for n and on, it's gonna be bounded, the norm squared will be bounded by this. So this will be the norm, I guess the norm squared of this, uh, less than or equal to this. And then from then on, it's gonna be bounded by one over two to the n. So I guess here we'll get one, one over two to the n minus one, when you sum up all those terms. Uh, so in particular that this is, you know, a finite, a finite value. So that this is well-defined. So it's, therefore C is well-defined. Uh, but now I claim that C is unbounded. Um, and why is that? So if, say, C of T were less than or equal to some M, uh, so then uh, what can we say? We could say that, um, uh, so therefore, since this is taking direct sum, we could say that therefore, for each epsilon greater than zero, there exists some m, some n, such that uh, this norm c n minus pi t uh, c n is. Uh, wait, hold on, let me think about this. Uh, okay, maybe I'm trying to prove the wrong thing. Uh, five implies two.
Ah, okay, so I know how to make this a uh, bit more rigorous. Uh, so let me change this slightly. Let me add here, rather than one over two to the n, let me take one over four to the n. And then I'm gonna multiply this by two to the n. Okay, so that doesn't change this estimate so much. I still have uh, two to the K there. And now here I'll have, uh, I had one over four and now I have one over two, so that's better. Uh, so, okay, so this is still finite. So we get that the co-cycle is well-defined, uh, but now I claim that this is the case. Okay, so I claim that this is bounded. Uh, so why is this bounded? That's because um, uh, I claim that, let's compute, so C is unbounded. In fact, I claim, why, why is this? Since otherwise, we have that the soup over all T unbounded on sigma. Otherwise, we have the, the soup over all T on sigma of P Cn minus pi t Cn squared. So of course this is just, uh, this is greater than or equal to the cocycle squared. Um, so this is, uh, so I mean less than or equal, so this is less than or equal to the soup over t and sigma of the cocycle of t squared and then I've also uh, there's a two to the n so over two to the n so we see that that's why I added that and so then we see that what is this well this is then is would be less than or equal to um, m over two to the n which would go to zero so if this cocycle were bounded then we'd have that the soups of all of these vectors uh, go to zero, but we already see in the we already saw in the previous part that we can estimate the distance between C n and the space of invariant vectors by exactly these soups. So, but by the previous part of the proof, previous part of the proof. Uh, we showed that this would imply that, um, that the projection onto the space of invariant vectors of Cn minus Cn would go to zero, which would give us a contradiction. Right, because that's exactly what we showed in this proof of three implies two of the previous part. Uh, three implies two. And three implies two, we showed that if these soups could all be controlled uniformly, then, then we could take this convex combination and get this uh, vector, which was very close to our almost invariant vectors. All right, so that's how we can produce this unbounded uh, co-cycle on the group. Uh, so now we showed what? So we just showed five implies two. So that's now done. Uh, and of course, two implies uh, one is obvious. So that's good. So now we have left to show that uh, every, so we have to show that one implies Five. That's the last step to show. So one implies five. And again, we'll do this by contraposition. So by contraposition, there exists a cocycle which is unbounded on sigma. And now we're going to produce from this cocycle a representation which has almost invariant vectors but has no sigma invariant vectors. 
So by, by contraposition, there exists a co-cycle uh, C from gamma to H for some representation I such that C restricted to sigma is unbounded. So that's the uh, hypothesis. And from this, we want to show that the pair sigma gamma does not have relative property T. Uh, okay, so if you noticed at this point in this entire proof, nowhere have we used Schoenberg's theorem, which was the main theorem we proved in the last lecture. Uh, so you can guess this is where it's gonna be used. And indeed, that's the case. So we know that this co-cycle gives us this conditionally negative definite function. Uh, and this conditionally negative definite function gives us a semi-group of positive definite functions. So that's what I'm going to do here. Uh, so this co-cycle, or equivalently, the conditionally negative, def negative type function is unbounded on sigma. So let's go ahead and pick a sequence which and sigma which realizes this unbounded. So, so choose uh, sigma n and sigma such that the co-cycle at sigma n goes to infinity and more. Well, the one observation about this is that if the co-cycle at sigma n goes to infinity, then if you plug in any uh, other two things on the left or the right of this, this will still go to infinity as long as those things are fixed. So note that the norm of C of say T sigma n s, if we fix T and s, so we use the co-cycle identity. <clears throat> so this is C of T plus pi of T C of sigma n plus pi of T sigma n C of s. And then you notice that this is some fixed vector. This is fixed in its norm. And this is a sequence of vectors whose norm tends to infinity. So therefore, this whole thing will tend to infinity. And this is for each as n goes to infinity. And this is for each uh, fixed. The T and S don't need to be in sigma, they can be anywhere in gamma. Right? All right, so what can we do uh, by Schoenberg's theorem? Uh, the, uh, we have positive type functions, which then correspond to representations. So we have representations, uh, representations. say C uh, HT, HT, IT, I'm gonna write this out, IT mapping gamma to the entire group on HT. And we have uh, vectors CT, which are unit vectors, uh, unit vectors, such that, the inner product of pi t, uh, oh, let's see, I've been using t for group elements, so maybe I should not use t for a positive number uh, before I used a. So pi a, h a, c a, such that pi a of t, c a, c a. So this is equal to the exponential of negative a times the norm of the co-cycle at t squared. All right, so this is Schoenberg's uh, theorem that said that if we take, well, we get this co-cycle, we take its norm squared, that gives us a conditionally negative type map. And Schoenberg's theorem said that then if we take the exponential of negative a times that map, we get a positive type map. 
and the GNS construction then says positive type maps are all matrix coefficients of exactly this type. Moreover, we can assume that these representations are cyclic, uh, unit cyclic vectors. That'll be important for us here. All right, so then uh, what's the thing to notice? So note that if we plug in the sequence for our for Tn, then we get a sequence which tends to infinity, and so this will tend to zero. And moreover, we can apply a T and an S on the left and the right. So we have that pi A of sigma N, and now we have pi of S C A and pi of T C A, that this goes to zero as N goes to infinity. And this is for all A greater than zero, for all T and S and gamma fixed. So if we fix two of these vectors and then we take N to be infinity, this sequence which realizes this unbounded, well, we get exponential to the negative unbounded, so this goes to zero. Uh, but now here we can take, start taking sums, finite sums of things here, finite sums of things here, and that gives us, because it's a cyclic representation, that gives us a dense set of things. And you can see that this condition here of coefficients going to zero, you can pass from a dense set to the whole space. So taking spans and closures, then shows that for all C and eta and H A, if we look at pi A sigma N C eta, that this goes to zero. So what does this mean in particular? This means that there's no sigma invariant vectors for any of these representations because otherwise we could have plug in C and eta, we could put them as the sigma invariant vectors, and then we just get the norm of C squared, right? So the conclusion therefore is that none of these vectors have any sigma invariant vectors. Uh, so we get the therefore, therefore pi A has no non-zero sigma invariant vector. And hence, uh, for any A, so if we take the direct sum over all A, then this doesn't. Or you can choose a sequence tending to zero if you want to stay within the realm of countability, of separability. So this has no sigma invariant vector. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I claim that it does have almost invariant vectors for the whole group. Uh, but, again, if we look at uh, pi A of T, C A minus C A, norm squared, well, again, expand this out. So this is twice, and these are univectors, so it's one minus uh, the real part, but actually these are um, uh, the real part you see right here, it'll be already real. So we get one minus uh, the inner product of pi A T C A C A, which is just two times one minus the exponential of negative A uh, co-cycle at T squared. And so now you see that if you take a to if you fix t, so before we showed that if you fixed a and then took sigma n to infinity, then this got went to zero, um, or sorry, this term right here then went to zero, so that one minus it went to one. But now instead we're going to fix t and let a tend to infinity, and then you see this tends to um, uh, exponential of negative infinity. Wait, something's, uh, hold on, where you, no, we fix T and send A to zero, 
And so it's an exponential of zero, which is one, so it's one minus one is zero. So this tends to zero as a tends to infinity for each fixed d. So therefore, this uh, sequence or this net CA uh, is almost invariant Uh, and this sits inside of this direct sum of all these H -L HAs. So here's your representation. It has almost invariant vectors, but it has no sigma invariant vectors at all. All right, so that finishes the proof of all these equivalences of property T. Any questions about that? All right, we're moving along pretty quick, but uh, we're still somehow a, a lecture behind of where I wanted to be at this point. Uh, so let me, um, all right, let me give you one more characterization of property T because that's what we'll need to prove that SL3Z has property T. Uh, and so for this, this is gonna be a characterization only for finitely generated groups. And uh, because of this, I think it uh, becomes a bit too technical if you do relative property T this way. So let me just stick with actual property T for finally generated groups. So now we let gamma be a finitely generated group. With generating set S. And uh, to make my life easier, I will assume that S is the same as its inverse, and I'll assume that it contains the identity. Now, much of what I'm going to do uh, won't require these assumptions, but I don't want to stay specifically when we do or do not need them, so I'll just assume them throughout. All right, so what can we do with this? So if we have a representation, so if I mapping gamma to u of h is a representation. I'm going to define, we define the uh, gradient uh, of pi to be the operator um, This, and it's gonna depend on S, and it also depends on pi, but maybe let me leave off the pi because it's already too much notation. So this is gonna be a map from the Hilbert space H to the direct sum of, over, um, over S of H. So this is just some finite direct sums of H, and this is gonna be given by the gradient of some vector C is just going to be the direct sum of C minus pi S C. So that's the gradient operator. Uh, and then, uh, so of course, this is a bounded operator. That's easy enough to see. And whenever you have a bounded operator, you should try to compute its adjoint. So let's go ahead and compute the adjoint of this operator. Uh, so we see here that uh, the gradient uh, of C and to compute the adjoint, you have to take the inner product with an, with an arbitrary vector in the, in the codomain. So that's the sum of S and let's say we have eta sub S, so S and S. And let's compute this and we see that this when we plug in the formula, this is going to be the sum of C minus pi S C eta S. And now we move the pi to the other side using that this is a unitary representation. So it's sum over S and S, S and S. And now we have here C, and then we're gonna have an eta S. And then when we move that to the other side, we're gonna have minus pi S inverse S. And now we can move the sum inside. So we see that therefore we have the 
divergence. Uh, is the operator it's just going to be the adjoint and it's going to be defined by the sum over s and s eta s is exactly equal to the sum for s and s of eta s minus uh, s inverse eta s so the divergence is just defined to be the adjoint of the gradient. And finally, we can define the Laplacian. The Laplacian is defined as the divergence of the gradient. And you can see exactly what this is, and we'll denote this by, say, delta. Uh, and then we can compute this directly. So delta s at a vector c. This is just the divergence of rec sum over s and s of c minus s of c, which then we compute it, plug in the formula we just saw. So this is. Uh, sum over s and s, then we're going to have c minus pi s c, and then we're going to have minus pi s inverse c minus pi s c, which then we get this is twice, and we're going to have here, um, oh, I see, I probably should have made some normalization because now we have the size of s times uh, c and then we're going to have minus and then we're going to have the sum over s and s pi s c and then we're also going to have the sum and the s inverses but that's where i took the set to be symmetric so that's the same as the sum of the set and s's um and now i see i made the one unfortunate uh, uh terminology and that is better to get to put the s in the definition. So let me change this a little bit. So the definition is I'm going to add a one over square root for the size of s here. And so then that'll be carried around everywhere. One over square root of the size of s. And then we see when we do this, we're going to get uh, one over root one over s and now the s comes out and we get this c minus one over s so that looks a little bit nicer okay so this is the laplacian uh and uh the nice thing about this is that this operator right here you see it contains these convex combinations over over the uh over the operator and so it tells you how far away this vector is from being invariant almost invariant on the generating set and so in fact we'll see uh next time that property t is equivalent to the spectrum to zero not being an accumulation point in the spectrum of this operator so note that the spectrum of this operator is contained in zero to infinity. Actually, you can compute the bound. This should be uh, maybe a contraction or twice a contraction. Um, and uh, and the thing to, we'll show next time that, uh, uh, let me write it as a theorem, gamma has T if and only if there exists some constant C greater than zero such that for all representations, pi, the spectrum of this operator intersect the interval zero to C is empty. So this is the next theorem uh, that will prove. So this is some, sometimes called the spectral gap characterization of property T. Uh, so if you like, since we're taking all representations, this is really a statement about 
this operator can be defined, this operator lives in the universal C star algebra of the group. So it's just saying that in the universal C star algebra of the group, you have spectral gap for this operator. That's another way to say it, rather than saying for every representation. Um, and this is not um, quite the, the characterization we'll use to show SL3Z has T, but we'll use this to prove one more characterization due to Shalom. Uh, and then we'll, we'll give Shalom's argument on Wednesday. Was there a question, Sri? Yeah, if you switch the quantifiers, is it still true? Uh, that if for every representation there exists a C, well, of course you could take the universal representation like I just said, so. Oh, okay. okay. So yes. Of course, zero will be in the spectrum if you take the trivial representation. So you could have zero and in fact, zero will, will exactly give you the trivial representation, but, but above zero and below C, you have this spectral gap. All right.